Hi, welcome to the table. My name's Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Wendell. And you're going to see our top games of 2018. Now, usually we've done a top five each, uh, but we decided this year with our top 30s being very recently that all you'd see was our five games from our top 30s that released last yeah. year. So we've kind of amalgamated our list this time. We're going to do a complete top 10. Um, and the way we did it is we each picked our favourite 10 games. We kind of gave them ranking points, we added them all together, and we came out with like a shared list. Now, there was a fair bit of crossover, wasn't there? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons we chose to amalgamate them, because we thought there would be a lot of crossover. And there was a, quite a bit, mm. although not necessarily three way crossovers. No, me no. and Mark had a lot, didn't yeah. we? And we, we all had, we, I think yeah, we all had we some all different crossovers, crossovers yeah. in different ways. Um, so, yeah, so we've had some crossovers uh, like that. Um, so, we've done, done this list. We're going to go through 10 through 1 as usual. Um, and we'll give you the reasons for why, you know, whose favourite game it was as we get to that point. Uh, but there have been a few games that we've all really enjoyed, and you'll see those on that list too. So, without further ado, let's take it away. Oh, goody. It's number 10. Uh, so our number 10 of the year uh, is a game from the Exit series of games, it is Mysterious Museum, and with better memory, maybe it would have been higher. <laughs> uh, Jonathan remembered liking it, but couldn't remember the name of the game, and they kind of all blur into one for you, don't that they? That is my problem. I love the Exit games and the Unlock games, but they all sort of merge into one in my mind. Um, but the, I think the reason the Exit ones, particularly this year, we preferred them was because they're more thematic. At least that was for me that made a big difference. They have a, no, so yeah, they have a progression. I, the theme doesn't really matter to me. It could, we could be set anywhere, but they had a definite progression as you're going along. You're doing this, which unlocks you this, and you did a little And the Mysterious, Mysterious Museum, you kind of like go into a museum, you, you get into Orson Welles' time machine, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. and you start going back in time, and you have to try and solve problems to try and kind of keep jumping in time, hoping to eventually get to a point where you can go back forward as well. And that's kind of the theme of the game. Yeah, plus we all got given a nice gift at the end to take home with us. But yeah, you're right. They've done it with... They had the Sunken Treasure this year, which was, I think, was the first one I played of the new current set, which was going through... So don't turn over the next page, which is a lot of the previous mm -hmm. ones. Then the Orient Express was probably my favourite of the three this year. That it was, was my... the most thematic in terms of incorporating yeah. the story into it. I like the murder mystery thing as well. Yeah. I think that's... The sort of thing that's on my street, so I think that also the theme for that one captured me. I just remember at the end of Mysterious Museum, we get to the end and I think, oh wow, I think that's, you know, I think, uh, I think both of them might have said, I can't remember, I said that's probably one of the best ones I've ever done. Mm. And it wasn't because it was hard or challenging, it was just because it was just well done. Mm. And the funniest bit was right near the yeah. start, Jonathan, Jonathan picks something, says, oh, that looks like one of those things. Half an hour later, we need one of those things. All three of us blanked <laughs> that we had it right in front of us. We knew it was there from the start. Yeah. We'd spotted it. What could this be? <laughs> I don't, don't know. Don't have a clue. So we got a bit of a laugh there. And we played it in front of our staff at the cafe who heard us say the first thing and then, then watched us struggle near the end. And we go, duh. <laughs> um, so that kind of experience is pretty good. We did solve it, but we all we all like Lexa games. And I think that's probably my favourite of all time. That's why it's on my list. Unbelievable. It's number nine. Okay, so our number nine is Brass of the Birming Variety that came out this year. Uh, this was my top pick, purely because I'm. it's well known that I like economic sort of games, and this is very much that. But this, there seems to be like two styles. There's the ones that, that, uh, that concentrate on the numbers, and the ones that contain, like concentrate on the physical space, like the board. And this is more on the physical variety, thing like food chain, magnate, and that sort of thing. I care what other people are doing on the physical board. And I just love that, the whole thing of, I've got to see what other people are doing to work out what I need to do, because I need to open up markets for them to buy from me, and they've got to have markets opening up because what they are going to need from coming from them. And so it's, it's just the sheer amount of constant being aware of what everybody else is doing, and everybody's in that game. It's not a heads down, don't look at what everybody else is doing game. This is a very much, I care what everybody else is doing on board all the time. It makes it really hard, because... You undoubtedly get done in by the players, jumping, they've got that, they're just that slight bit ahead of you at times, they grab that thing you wanted when you wanted it, yeah. and it ruins your, and scuppers your plans. But yeah, I love it, it's fantastic. It's interesting, when someone describes a game as interactive, I have mixed feelings usually, because you have good interaction and bad interaction. I don't like the kind of take that interaction where you're just smacking people down. But this has what for me is the best type of interaction, where you just care an awful lot about what everyone's doing. They affect you without directly giving you take that if you like. Um, and it does it really, really well. Uh, I would find it hard to differentiate between Lancashire and Birmingham. I think Lancashire was the original one, which yeah. they redid. 
and then Birmingham's like a new map and there's a few new mechanics. Uh, Big game is a little Birmingham rather is a little bit more complicated, and I think it is the better game. But they're both really, really good, and I had a great time playing both of them. They both get redone this year, and the production quality and the artwork and everything yeah. fantastic. I've only actually played the Lancaster version. I've not played the Birmingham one yet, mm -hmm. so I won't be able to compare them. But yeah. It's get, but you get to play it a lot. You've brought it quite a few times, haven't you? Yeah, and I know others have it. It's, a, it's yeah. gone down really popular. Yeah, yeah. Golly gosh, it's number eight. Uh, so number eight is the spiritual successor to Tzolkin. It's by one of the same designers, uh, and it is Teotihuacan. And Teotihuacan was the kind of the Euro to come out at Essen this year. It was the one that most people were looking forward to. And we were really looking forward to it too. So we got a copy straight after Essen. And we've played it quite a lot, and a lot of people have played it quite a lot at the cafe and stuff. Um, Teotihuacan, you're building a pyramid using kind of like a, a, a dice placement rondel system mm -hmm. where the numbers on the dice matter, where you can move them matters, and you're kind of going clockwise. But you're trying to pile a dice up, because if you go there with more dice, it's, it's more expensive to do the action, but you get a stronger action. Um, I, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's quite successful. It feels like looser than... Tolkien, uh, you've kind of just, you just you can just kind of do what you want. That's punishing. So, yeah. what if that's intentionally so though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of all the Euros, this has been the most popular one. Certainly, to have come from Essen in terms of cafe play. Yeah, people mm. have played this one more than any other one. It was Gaia Project all year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then Teotihuacan came out, and suddenly lots of people were playing that. Um, it is really, really good. Um, it didn't make my top ten of the year. It, although it would sort of be an honourable mention. I think maybe that's because it's just a little bit dry. Um, the colours are quite pastel, and although there is some theme there, it doesn't grab me in the same way that Zolkin does. I really, really like Zolkin. Um, but it's still a great game. There's that whole tension between you kind of want your dice in lots of different spots to be able to take lots of different actions, but you want them all in the same spot because then you get much more powerful actions. And it's so, you know, do you put them together or do you spread them out? It, it's really, really difficult. And that gives you really interesting decisions, if you like, all the way through the game. Yeah, I, I think I prefer it being slightly less punishing and a little bit less upfront cost to get into it than Zolkin. I mean, I think spiritual success is one way to put it, but they actually feel fairly different. I know they're about timing, but I don't actually yeah. necessarily in the mechanisms. If anything, it's the thing that's closest rather than the actual specific. Yeah, I think the thing yeah, yeah. Um, The thing I like most about it and why it rated well for me is because... I found it very simple and easy when looking at the board to see what everybody was trying to do. A lot of things you say in games is do something different to what everybody else is doing, that's the best thing to do. But the very game was very fluid, is in somebody was doing something, but after a while that strategy was running out, it was time it was starting to burn out on points. So mm -hmm. they'd have to fluidly move over to something else. Yeah. And you so like now you're fluidly moving into my space. Yeah. And so I now need to have fluidly move over to somewhere else. <laughs> And so we all inter affect each other by having to change yeah. the strategies as other people change the strategies. Well, while a lot of them, you go, this is my strategy for the game, and I'm going to do it. Yeah, you stick you to just it, can't yeah. do it in that because the point scale runs out. You yeah. get done in as the game goes on. The more something's done, the worse it is to do. Or you try and build the pyramid, and you've got dice, dice, build, yeah. build, build. And all your dice are on the build pyramid spot. Well, if you want to keep building it, you've got to send all your dice all the way yeah. back around again. Yeah. Um, or at least maybe one dice, but it takes a couple of turns to do it. So maybe it's better to say, well, that space is free. It doesn't cost me anything. I'll go and do that instead. Um, it's very nice. I think I prefer Tolkien as a game like Jonathan. I think I like tight your games and planning ahead is a bit easy in Tear to Wacken. Mm. And the other thing I'm uh, a bit filled with is the rules. There's a lot of extra things you have to remember every time you take an action. You paying, mean, paying for yeah. the afterlife thing, turning your dice around, the co extra costs and stuff like that. So you need somebody who's on the ball yeah. and you're reminding people to do all the little bits all the way through. Especially yeah. if people haven't played before. So. Yeah, it's yes. definitely a, a thing which we talked about having a little help card just to tick off your turn yeah. would just yeah. make it... It needs to be a tiny, tiny thing. Because you don't actually need lots of game rules because the symbology is fairly fine. Just what am I doing in my turn? Yeah, it's order. a bit like Yokohama. When you yeah. get to Yokohama, it says, put your things down, move your person, do the action, do the thing, build yeah. the building, get the bonus. Yeah. And it has it in an early order you have to do it. And that would be nice, I think. Yeah. Crikey, it's number seven. The next one is one of my favourites and it's been in my top ten for many years and that's Arkham Horror. And uh, particularly so this year because they came out with a third edition which is definitely better than any of the previous editions, I think, and better than Eldritch Horror, which was like a slight sort of sidestep um, that they took a few years back. Um, but it takes all the theme of the kind of small town Arkham, which I really enjoyed. You know, it's very atmospheric. 
I used to play it with the um, like a soundtrack that's been specially designed with the kind of twenties music and the old kind of you get like thunder and ghouls and things who pop up occasionally. Um, but really enjoy getting into that. But the mechanics are much more streamlined. They're just better mechanically, really. Um, so it takes quite a few things from like Pandemic, for instance, the Doom tokens, which traditionally would appear on the Doom track. And if you get too many, you sort of lose the game for like the old one shows up. Um, are appearing all over the board instead in the third edition. So you have to run around the board, pandemic style, clearing up the Doom. Um, but again, they use the deck mechanic, which is that wherever the Doom initially starts appearing, it keeps reappearing in the same spots. So you run over here, you clear it out, you run over somewhere else, then suddenly it pops up back where you just were. It's like, ah, oh, I just cleared that out, and now we've got to go back and deal with it again. But it gives you lots of, again, things to think about from a mechanics point of view. Whereas I think the second edition even was just... I'll just go here and do this and see what happens. There wasn't too much strategy involved, whereas the third edition is far more strategy. Yeah, it's tighter, it's cleaner. Interesting what we were just saying about the previous game. There's less overhead in this than much less. I yeah. don't feel like I'm struggling to work out what I've, what my list of things to do in my go is. I kind of know what to do and then we all do it together. Um, I think it's because it also grabs the story bit from Eldritch Horror, depending on the gods you're facing against, and that... Just gives it a bit more longevity than the second edition, where ultimately the god was, it was just a different boss. It didn't actually change the game, really, that you're playing. Yeah. Unless you start adding like, expansions and stuff. But this is, each game doesn't necessarily feel hugely different, but there's a different list of tasks. And the, and the monsters are themed to you, what you're fighting and things like that. I mean, like the obvious one, the first one we played, just tons of cultists, which is cool. What you think. And so it just, it just makes you want to go back and play different scenarios more, because they're not all going to feel the same. And because you could, it, while it's still a longer game, the fact that it sits in a, a much neater, quicker package, it's not the only game you get to play that evening anymore. It's a lot shorter. It's still long, <laughs> yeah, but it's probably half the length of what it was before. In fact, we've arranged to play a game tonight. Um, they, with, they have. <laughs> <laughs> with a guy who didn't like the second edition, but played the third edition. It's like, oh, this is much better. I really like this. So if you are not sure about it because of the length and things, uh, you might want to check this one out because it's um, quite I mean, significantly improved over the previous versions. I've judged and not played it. It's not my sort of game, I'm afraid. And so, it's number six. Okay, so our number six is Heroes of Land, Air and Sea, which is a game I didn't actually think when we combined the list would make it. I thought I'd be the only one who picked it and uh, I'd be the one putting it very high up, but it's... Yeah, Jonathan likes to, he's played it with me. It's a, it, I guess it is a 4X game, and it does that very well, but it does it in such a neat package that I, it's very hard to fault because it's, there's a lot going on, each race plays differently, it is a 4X game, so you do something like me, take care of stuff, but it plays with Euro scoring in it, so it isn't just kill people, that isn't, having fights is, is high for get, good for getting points but it's not the only way to win the game and in fact that you won't win the game just doing that and also you get points from battles even when you lose yeah. it's not just that the winner gets points which I really like yeah because I mean and especially with the card play that goes involved in the battles you can optimise points even when losing yeah like I said because the race is played differently and I like the fact that it really feels like uh, 90s Warcraft would be the best way to put it. Like, yeah. so that little dude used to go and do some farming initially, they get new resources. Then, but then if somebody sends in like the bigger dudes, they're going to kill off all the little worker guys to, to strip you of resources. It just plays like that, like the late 90s sort of um, strategy game. And yeah, <laughs> and being able to do that in such a, it's just such a well-rounded package. It, I don't, I don't think that anything's yeah. too complex. Okay, there's a lot going on in your personal flyer board, but generally speaking, it all becomes pretty easy to see what's going on after a couple of rounds, and it just works really well. Yeah, it's not too long, which is nice. Mm. Um, you have, you can kind of upgrade your unit stroke buildings, mm. but you can never do um, even half of it. You never yeah. manage. So you really have to pick a strategy for like a start. Okay, I'm going to try this building and this unit, let's say, this game, and see how it works out. Um, which is really nice. I mean, you know, there's plenty of variation in terms of repeated plays. The other thing I really like, though, is it has that kind of Kemet system of, although the map looks big and spread out, all the different locations are much closer to each other than it first appears. Effectively, the board kind of wraps round. So if you go off one end, you appear on the other end. So it has these four big islands or continents, but it's actually remarkably easy to get to the kind of furthest point on the opposite island. 
So everyone's much closer together than it first appears. You sort of think you can build up and then gradually expand, but suddenly you've got people on your island here and over there. It's like, oh, what are you doing? This is my island. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a really nice package. In fact, uh, for that kind of game, it's quite light-hearted, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a game that really does it better. It's just, it's a great light-hearted dude on the map game. Yeah, I think it will, uh, long, with a lot of people, get a lot of play time because they might not want to play a four plus hour 4X game, and this is probably your best option you're going to get. Yeah, yeah. Because you have science in there, you have fighting in there, but you have some level of negotiation of if you leave that alone, I'll go and get him. And also, it, one thing I really like is there's very little downtime for players because we uh, there's a, like a following me mechanism in there. Yeah, that's Which nice. again, so there's just another thing to keep every investment table all the time. While in a lot of Forex games, you can kind of go away for a bit <laughs> and wait to come back yeah. and see what's changed. Marvelous. It's number five. I can never work out what the name of this next game is because although it was released in German as Ganz schön clever, the English title seems to be pretty darn clever, but we can't find an English version for love nor money. But it's a fantastic game, and to be honest, it doesn't matter if you've got the German version, it works just as well. It's a roll and write where you're rolling some coloured dice and you're picking one each time to add your grid, and you're kind of writing numbers in or crossing in on this little paper sheet. But it, although it doesn't sound particularly appealing, or at least it didn't to me when it was described, there are so many interconnected mechanisms, it feels like a big Euro game yeah. condensed into a really small package. And I think that's why we all really mm. like this one, don't it's we? It's uh, the first game so far that has appeared on all three of our favourite games of the year. Yeah. So um, I thought it would. I thought it might be the biggest crossover we have, but there is another one coming up. You kind of fill up certain sections of your sheet to get points, or as you fill up certain sections, it unlocks other crosses or numbers you can write in other sections. So you get these turns where it's like, well, if I take this dice, then I can get a cross here, which lets me write a number in here, and then I can put a cross here, and that unlocks a bonus, which lets me take another dice, and then I can, suddenly you have this explosive turn where lots of different comboing actions all come together at once. Uh, so balance is key as well, so basically you can't ignore a colour. Um, if you kind of just go all about on the greens, you get a really high green score, but if one of the other scores is low, there are these foxes, and foxes score you your lowest colour. So if yellow is scoring you 10 points or nothing, all your foxes score nothing. Uh, and someone else has got three foxes or four foxes with 20 each, they're just going to beat you. Yeah. So you have to balance it out, so you can't just kind of all go out on one number. Um, and kind of, you've got these re-rolls you've got to balance as well, and the plus ones you've got to balance as well. Do I plus one that now, or do I wait to hope to get a better shot later on? And then there's the whole interaction of, well, I'm, you're taking these dice, I get one of those dice. Don't take that dice, <laughs> don't yeah. take that dice. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. can always pick one of the ones they haven't yeah. picked, haven't yes. they? Yeah, yeah, so okay. do you like, don't. Especially in a two-player game, you can think about what they, they, they would like from this role and think, well, okay, well, you're not having that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's quite that's quite nice. It is some player interaction. Maybe not with four players because it might be harder to kind of do everyone in with restricting what they get. But definitely in a two player game, there's some good key interaction. I believe it's our favourite role and right for each one of yeah, us. So, great. so we've played. I played quite a few recently. I've put a few more in, thinking it's a really nice me mechanic I like. But I haven't found one that competes with Pretty Dunk Clever. Well, I never. It's number four. Uh, so our number four is a game that Hark hasn't played, uh, mainly because we've only played it ourselves very recently, and that is my favourite Euro game of the year, and Ooh. that is Newton. Yeah. Um, and Jonathan rates quite highly well, that's why it's at number four. We've both played it a few times each, or two or three times each. In fact, I played it after making my top 30 games yeah. of all time, and it would be in my top 30 yeah, me, me having too. played it now. Uh, and given it's, in my opinion, it's a very good year for Euro games, this is high praise indeed. Um, Newton is... Uh, Simone Luciani uses Voices of Marco Polo, Grand Austria Hotel. He's becoming one of my favourite Euro game designers. Um, the theme, other people say it's thematic, I'm not so sure, but basically, you, you've just got five actions, okay? And you play a card with an action, and you do that action, but you're playing it on this desk, and the more cards and tokens on this desk that you have with the same action on it, every time you play the action, you play a stronger version. So I could go travelling, strength one, and then if I go travelling again in the same round, well, my first travelling action is still there, I get a stronger travelling action. Um, and you just don't have time to do everything in this game, so you're trying to acquire more cards and fill your bookcase to get points in the round and travel to get to various locations to get points or to enable filling your bookcase easier, and then you're working to get money because money allows you to do bonus actions, and then you're uh, inventing stuff to get end game scoring, and there's all this different stuff, and you're kind of balancing it well. Um, I even tried doing a strategy where I filled no books on New Year's Eve. It um, worked. And it worked, yeah, just, just, just to see if it was possible, because filling the bookcase seems like the way everyone kind of thinks, that's a clear way to get points, and you know, it's nice to see that you can do other things in the game and get away with it, effectively. 
For completing certain rows or columns in this bookcase, once they're complete, you then start accruing points every round. So for a certain row, you might get five points every round thereafter. So if you fill in certain sections of the bookcase, you're suddenly ramping up to 15 or 20 points every round. And in the first game we played, a couple of people did that and won. You know, at least it was very tight between those two and the other two didn't do so well. And we were like, oh, surely the books has got to be the yeah. way to go every time. But you're like, no. Yeah, I just tried to prove them wrong. Actually. So I threw, all, I actually discarded my book action, so I couldn't, and I didn't place a single book throughout the game. Um, and I got an end game scoring in mid-game points, but everyone else was getting 20 points around near the end of the, end of the game, and I was still managed to just be a bomb, which is very satisfying. Yeah, it's it makes just... me want to play it more, because I like games where there's definitely a moving strategy. Yeah. There's enough games where I've played where, oh, there's lots of strategies, but there isn't really. There's one, you, there's something you always need to do. Some bits to be able to have a something where you don't always feel like you have to do the same thing as everybody else. It makes it far more interesting to me. It feels very nicely balanced, and there's a lot of variation from game to game because there's a huge number of like uh, tokens and spaces that change each time. Yeah. So you kind of seed the board randomly, and it's like this game. These are the things that get you points at the end of the game. And these are the bonuses you can get during the game, so it really changes a lot. Yeah, I'd like to. I mean, maybe it loses that long-term playability, but for the moment, it's my go to you a game. I want to try something new out. I'll, I'll give this a go. Um, and it seems like other people who like playing with us like to join in. So yeah. I'm sure you'll get a game soon. Mm, yeah. Extraordinary. It's number three. Uh, so. Our number three is my favourite game of the year. It was Jonathan's also mentioned, but Mark rated it quite highly too, and that is Decrypto. Decrypto is that team versus team word game akin to Code Names and Crosstalk and some of the other games there. Um, but for me, what makes Decrypto better than the other games is it gets more tense as it goes on. You're trying to pass clues to your teammates while trying to crack their clues, and the, the more information that has been passed between us as a team, the easier it is for them to try and crack our clues. So the harder we have to do, but then the harder we make ours, then there's a chance our teammates don't get it. And the rising tension, the games that last, you know, maybe half an hour where so you're on the sixth round and you think, I think I know what two of the words are. Oh my God, does that mean that or this? It just, it's just a really nice feeling for what is meant to be a light party game. I can play this with gamers and have a really good time and I can play some non-gamers as well and have a really good time. It feels more of a gamers game to me than say code names. So code names, I think you could play with just about anybody, you know, as long as they're happy with word games. But uh, Decrypto is definitely a step up. You need to think quite a bit more, I think. Uh, to do more you play it. Yes, the more you play it, you realise the more there is to it. So if you're a gamer who likes your word games, they don't really get any better than this, I think. I think Steve's hit the nail on the head with this one. It's that stress of my options slowly closing in on me. Of, yeah. uh, Oh, I thought I could get away with that, but I probably can't now because they've obviously worked that and they're not doing. And you just feel like your list of words is going slowly reducing as you work, you pre think of someone, and then you go, can't do that anymore, can't do that. You can, get, you can get to a point where you think, well, I can give this as a code and they will not crack it. This is a really sneaky way of doing it. But as soon as I've given it, they're going to go, oh, this means that, and they'll have cracked your word. So yeah. when, do you, when do you kind of use that super clue? Because as soon as you've used it, they crack one of your four words, uh, and you've kind of got. Well, once they crack two words, you're in real trouble. You're always trying to find obscure ways of connecting the thing. So you know you've got four words, and you're trying to get your team to home in on one of the four words. Let's say with the clue, but you need to pick it in such a way that it might look like it's one of the other things mm -hmm. to someone who doesn't really know. But when you can see all four of the words, oh, although it could be either of these, it's really going to be this one. But you kind of want to put the other team off by going to the other one, sort of. And that one's really that one, so this one must be that one, and yes. not that one. Yeah, 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 that's very good. Um, uh, I really like, we had a competition at the cafe where we had like a knockout and you played each other, and as soon as you lost two games, you were out. And the people who entered it had a really good time. Um, so yeah, it's that's my, fa my favorite game of the year, um, the crypto. Ah, spiffing, it's number two. Okay, the next one is another heavy Euro, and that is our last three-way crossover, which is Gugong, uh, which is a superb Euro. Uh, I picked it up at Essen, and it's all about card play. So there's a bunch of action spaces on the board, and you go there, you take your actions, um, but you also have actions on the card. So you play a card to a space, you get to take the action on the card, as well as the action on the board. But there will be a card on the board already, so you swap it with the one that's on the board, and the one that you take goes into your discard pile and becomes your hand for next turn. So there is so much to think about, because it's uh, when you play the card, you have to play a higher number than the previous card. So it's like, I want to use this action, but I can only use it here or here, because the other numbers are too high. 
but I don't really want these two actions on the board. I really want this action on the board, but this card isn't high enough. Maybe I should use this other card, but the ability's not as good on this card, but I really want the action. And then you add in the whole, and which card will I get to use on my next round? It's like, oh my goodness. Essentially, you're just collecting points in lots of different ways, um, but the, the thought involved in that is just really nice. I've never really seen anything that does it quite like that. You're explaining it now and you're stressing me out already by just, <laughs> just explaining all the options you've got. Um, it has one really nice aspect to it, as well as all the thinking, which is fine, is that there's a track in the middle. If you don't get to the top of the track by the end of the game, your score is zero. Not only can you not win, your score is zero, so you can't even come second or third or anything like that. And that's just really nice as to what, you know, I need to do that. It doesn't gain me anything, but it just stops me losing the game. Yeah. Um, and kind of finding the right time to move from that track and punishing other people when it's their turn to move from that track and stuff is really nice. Yeah, having the cards do, some cards do dual actions, it's, it's really cool because of the way you need to plan about doing them. But I like the fact that the, the different sections of the board, they're obviously clearly split apart and they do feel like little individual systems only small ones they're not major like massive game ones but this one gives me the bonuses this one gives me point for doing the wall but that only gets that only gets um, triggered at particular times when something happens in another system and only if someone yeah. only if the other one who's built the most yeah yeah one. and that and then we've got this ship so you're moving down there so you've got that kind of blocks people off so if i'm sat there you can't go there and then and that sort of thing and then you've got the little moving around the top because they're all nice little individual systems but because you need to because the way the cards force you to only be able to affect particular systems at any one time and b sometimes affect multiple systems but maybe not in the order even the order you want to do them uh, it, it does all work together really well. It's how they all become one giant system works very really nice. Mm. Uh, I think you'll be prepared to have a slow game when you play this. I think we yeah. played. Uh, and we played with people, some, someone who played before and three people who hadn't, so it was going to be slow anyway. But every turn, even people who played before, every turn was slow because you, your options change and you have to analyse like all the stuff Jonathan was saying every time it's your turn to play because the board changes slowly like Mark yeah. says the systems all change the boats move different spots get filled up you know I can't go there now because he's played the too high a number um, and if you're happy with that I think it's an excellent new game yeah even when even though it is slow you still have tons to think about all the time it's not like you're sat waiting and you're bored it's like oh he's taking a long time but that's okay because I really need some more time as well because I'm trying to work out what to do here you need a backup plan every time but then you need another backup plan when your backup plan gets screwed by the previous yeah. person so uh, it's a great combination. If you like heavy Euros with lots of interacting mechanics, this is uh, top of the pile. By Jove, it's number one. And finally, our number one, which came out really early in the year. Yeah. It might be the earliest one of all of them so, in yeah. the year, because I think it just came just after Christmas. Yeah. It's from Kickstarter, from Cool Me or Not, and that is Rising Sun, which is the sort of spiritual spiritual successor to Blood Rage, but I'm not really sure it is, because it's different enough. It's a <laughs> massive dudes on the map game, uh, with massive monsters and lots of massive armies, but it has some of the best time of mechanism, Euro mechanisms, into that style of game. Particularly for me, the combat. Yeah. The whole thing's about, you're gaining money over a turn, and then when you go into combat at the end of the season, you're bidding essentially to win a particular thing and because of that it just throws the game wide open where initially you think i can't win this fight suddenly it's like well he doesn't know if i might go on this spot to do that i might screw his plan up and it happens so often let alone that which even works even better is the fact there's a particular order in all these fights so you're gaining money from some of the fights to then using later fights so sometimes throwing a fight just taking the money's good and it's how that all works together the dude in the map of fight is cool gaining abilities i mean that's all relatively commonplace we've seen in other games but the the combat mechanism just sets it apart for me i think eric m lang the designer did a really good job of incorporating euro mechanisms into blood rage but i feel like rising sun is just taking it another level higher it takes it really is the best of both worlds i'm not sure blood rage it really worked for everyone. But Rising Sun just seems to tick the boxes, because even you like this, don't you? I am not a fan of dudes in the map games. Some are very good, I can see that, but I actually like Rising Sun, mm. um, which is high praise, I think, indeed. And that's because of the Euro mechanisms in it, isn't it? Yeah, I, can, I, don't, 
I can lose fights and win the game. I can lose every fight and win the game. Mm. And I've I've lost a lot of fights and won the game before because you just get the bonus cards and you play, you can tailor your strategy to go around and lose fights. There's a big battle there, jump my little guy in there, lose that fight and get some points. Or however you're trying to, to manage your points. And there were different ways of doing it. And the factions themselves are actually quite diverse and give yeah, you a different, different playing ability every time you do it. Which is really nice because each time you play, it's like, oh, I want to try a different faction. And it's like, oh, where does this one take me? There's a very different strategy you're going to need to take if you're going to try and do well. Because it is not about just conquering as much of the map as you can. It's about getting as many points as you can. The other thing I really like about it is the fact that once you've co conquered the territory, you kind of get a token for it. And that will score you points at the end of the game. And you don't really have any incentive to conquer the same territory again. So it's like, oh, I'm going to move off and conquer a different territory. So you don't keep beating on the same person <laughs> because they're easy to win fights against. You want to keep moving and fighting against other people. And the money you get from the, from if you're in a fight and you don't win the fight, you get some of the money that was spent during the fight. Yeah. And then the fights order in a different order. And so mm -hmm. I think, well, that's the fourth fight. So if I can get a bit of money there and a bit of money here. Okay, so I'm not going to spend any money in those fights and prepare to win that one. It's really nice planning. And it looks great as well. Yeah, Huge yeah, yeah, monsters yeah. stomping around the map. It's, all that well. it's one of the best looking games there is. I yeah, think. yeah. I think the whole Japanese style theming something different enough, especially yeah. with that ancient Japan yes. mythology sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't see that. No, Vikings are fairly commonplace these days. That's right. It's original. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. You just don't see that Japanese fantasy. The camis and the, the demons and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they are our top 10 games of 2018. Uh, if you uh, obviously have got any comments below, please put them below. Do you think we've ranked them in the wrong order? Have we missed a brilliant game out that you would have put in your top 10? Um, because of the way we compile this, we each had a game that kind of fin finished fairly high on each of our individual lists, but didn't quite make the top uh, 10. What was yours? It's Coimbra. Mine well, was Coimbra, which is kind of came out around mid late of the year. It was early out in the US. I think it... It was just before the Essen rush of Euro, so at that point when it came out, probably about the best Euro had come out up to that point of the year. It's really cool. I, I like it because it's a it's a dice placement game where you're selecting from a shared pool, but essentially the order in which the dice go down in the four specific areas affect the order in which players get to take the action. And so you, it's just the way of well, if I do that there, that's going to do that. I might, I might get this because you're trying to like essentially get characters to give you. They give you the the actual things that give you the points and do stuff on the various like systems in the board. But it's that of well, I've gone that, but also because the the dice colors affect what you what action they can then trigger later. So I want that number, but I don't necessarily want the number of that color dice. And so how all those things get and and then the stress of somebody just going and just doing you in. Uh, I really like it. There's definitely some uh, Gujong level yeah. thinking in Coimbra. Um, it's a very good Euro. It's just that Essen then happened, yeah. and a whole pile of even better Euros. I came think out. Coimbra was my favourite Euro going into Essen, so yeah, mm. that is high praise. Uh, yours was one you saw at Essen, wasn't it? Yeah, Monolith Arena, which is the sequel to Nurishima Hex, uh, which I really, really like. It was in my top 30. Um, and it added newer Sigma Hex like an abstract game, but with lots of theme on it, strange. So you're kind of placing little hex units on the hex map. And then at one particular point, suddenly they all fight each other. So there's no fighting until a fight is triggered, and then everything fights at once in certain orders. And what the, this new version added is the monolith from Monolith Arena, which is like this stack of hidden units. And at a certain point in the game, you can choose to expand them, and they kind of go drop, drop, drop. And suddenly you fill up the board, which triggers a fight, and you've got lots more units than your opponent was expecting you to have. And that's really interesting. And then you have all the combat, lots of things die. And then it kind of um, sucks back up again afterwards, and you can choose to expand it at a later time. So it's a really nice little extra mechanic on top of what was already a great game. So if you like Neuroshima Hex, or if you like abstract games, I think this one's a great one. My last, uh, my one that no one else has mentioned on their list, so it didn't make the top ten, is Cryptid. And Cryptid is a game I see more and more on Facebook groups and stuff, and at the cafe it gets played. And the reason I'm warming to it more and more is that normally things like logic deduction puzzling games don't get played mm -hmm. at the cafe. They, they just kind of you play them once and you go outside. And I really like them, and I want to play them. I want to play things. I want to play these two-player abstracts and stuff, um, and logic deduction games. Um, and generally, I can't, so they kind of fade away. But this one hasn't. People still are happy to play this. People seem to the fact that it's got like a tactile area, can, not uh, like an area to it, like a spatial problem behind the logic problem, where you still have to. I want. I need to work out what theirs are, and then which one it translates to. Kind of changes it for me. And um, 
Uh, while people still playing it, I'm going to still rank it quite high. Very thinky. <laughs> you spend the entire game staring at that, going, "Oh, but is that could that be this or is that that?" And you're yeah. just trying to work through that deduction puzzle. So you've really got to like deduction puzzles. But as long as you do, I think this is the best deduction game out there. I don't think there's anything better than this one. It's really, really good for that style of game. But some people, I'll tell you now, are going to hate it. Yeah, yeah, it's a my game. And that's usually what happens to games like this. And so usually I don't get to play them, which means I don't rate them that highly. But this one, as it sounds, fingers crossed, touch wood and whatnot, people are still happy to play with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, they are our top 10 games of the year with a few nearly misses for each of us. Um, have you got anything to say? Have we, have we said, have you, do you agree with Rising Sun being the best game of 2018 or would you have picked a different one of our top 10 to rise to the top? Um, as usual, uh, if you like our videos, please like, share and subscribe and comment underneath. It helps us out and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, but anyway, we've been The Table. I've been Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hick. And I'm Mark Wendell. And see you soon. Bye. Bye.